Hey, it's Jason here from Fraser Valley Rose Farm, and today I'm at Sumas Grow Media. A lot of people have asked me before, where do I get my soil from? I talked a little bit in the video last year. Well, this is the place, and uh, excuse the noise, it is a busy place, but uh, I got a chance to have a tour with my soil guy. Everybody should have a soil guy, or I guess equally a soil gal, if that's the equivalent term uh, for, for respectful term for women who do the same job. And, uh, and he gave me a tour around the facility. I'm gonna stick it in here. It was a, it was a good and long tour. to try to get it down to the points that you guys might be the most interested in. So hang tight and I'll give you that, uh, that footage here. So that was the coconut in the raw form. Then once we, once we process it, because when, when the coconut grows on the, on the, most of the time they grow on the, uh, close to the coast. So when they grow, they suck up the salt from, from the environment and the salt actually stays within the tissue of the plant. So when you harvest it and, and you use the coconut um, uh, in the media, you have to dislodge that salt. And we do that uh, in the next couple of days, we do that with, by adding calcium nitrate and uh, turning the mix and then adding more calcium. So nitrate. that's something you do here, it's not something just, you get the supplier yeah. to do. If you, if you were to grow in this stuff straight out of the, the, mm -hmm. the blocks, it would, nothing would ever go because you'd mm -hmm. have uh, a very, very high parts per million of sodium. Now, when people buy, uh, this is called core, yeah? Yeah. When this they is buy chunky it, core. When they buy it from overseas, is it coming in with that salt or is it coming it's in? It's coming in with, with that salt, yes. Okay. You can buy so you be washed careful. and unwashed. Yeah. But um, at, at Sumas, we treat everything like it's unwashed. Right. Because we've bought washed material that's had salt in it, we've bought unwashed material that's had salt in it. Um, so we just say everything is going to get treated in the in the same way. Then it's going to get tested, and if it passes, it goes into production, like this. If it fails, it just goes right back into the into the uh, 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 leaching process. Well, that's good to know because a, a lot of people are, are treating core like it's the the holy answer to peach. But uh, if it's coming in with high salt levels, it's and coming in with high salt levels. Um, it, it is a waste product, but. You're schlepping it from Sri Lanka, and this is like a, a four-week journey in, in a tanker. So um, peat has a, a carbon footprint. Um, core has a different kind of carbon footprint, probably lower. Um, and, and certainly you're not, uh, you know, removing a, a wetland when you, right. when you work with, with coconut. But it's not a zero in, right. in terms of um, a carbon footprint. Um, like some of the, the wood waste products that we have are even lower in carbon footprint because they're grown organically, they're a waste product. And they're local. They're local, <laughs> right? Because right. the ships that bring this, they burn 2,000 liters an hour of yeah. fuel. So uh, that's a sizable amount of fuel by the time you get a container, shipping container of, of material here. So when you deal with car uh, compost, you always have a, a carbon to nitrogen ratio. We uh, get organic chicken manure and organic dairy manure and that composes a, a large fraction of the green section of the compost but you need to have some brown section of the compost. So we use um, some of our wood fibers to, to add to that so that you have more of a balance, so that you have a better uh, C to N ratio. The other thing is compost by nature or manures by nature have a very high pH into the eights. So if you add um, wood fiber. Wood fiber has a has a very low pH, so a pH of about four. So you get a, a, a much more usable product. That's one reason why when people continuously use mushroom manure in their garden, it works great the first year, the second year, and the third year it's not working that good anymore. It's because the, the compost has a pH of nine, and then over over years you you uh, you raise the pH of your of your soil to a point where you're getting a, a, a lockout of iron. So your plant can't assimilate iron anymore and a lot of the other metals, and then they go yellow. Yeah. So they look more like our vest <laughs> rather than nice, nice and green. <laughs> this is another organic product that uh, is mined. Um, there's a mine here in Pemberton. This is a product called uh, volcanic uh, pumice. Yep. And we have that in two different grades. Uh, this is the larger grade. Uh, it's similar in many ways to perlite, except perlite is essentially man-made. They, they blast that in furnaces, they take an ore, um, and the ore 
curiously enough, has a water molecule locked inside it. When you heat the ore very high, um, the water molecule turns into steam yeah. and explodes the, the, the ore, and you end up with a popcorn-looking thing like perlite. Yeah. But that takes a tremendous amount of energy. This, the energy was all supplied by Mother Nature and uh, happened thousands of years ago. But it's a similar sort of product. Uh, perl perlite is much lighter than pumice. Pumice is better suited for a nursery type application and, and the, the perlite is more suited for maybe a, a in, inside greenhouse application. Maybe. What's the cost difference between pumice and peat? Uh, about half. Okay. So pumice is about two-thirds the price of uh, pumice. Pumice is very expensive. Okay. It's not the fact, the pumice is actually cheap at the mine. Right. Bring it here. Yeah, so you heavy. guys are going to hear this reoccurring nightmare of, of trucking. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, the soil business is a shipping business. Basically, you've got a big, bulky, low value product that you've got to move from point A to point B. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the cost of it is associated with the truck. Yeah. There's this product called hydrofiber. So, hydrofiber is made from uh, a species of pine wood. And the furniture is a byproduct from the furniture industry. So they take all the little bits and, and pieces of, of uh, furniture that don't tr get turned into furniture and they grind them up uh, using stone uh, wheels basically um, so that they, they bring out the fibers. Then in addition to that, they use high quantities of heat so that they've removed all the, the, the sugars from the sap in the pine. You can still probably smell it. It says a slight smell of pine, but um, not, oh, not, yeah. not a lot. And what, what they, the reason that they take out all the sugars is when you add wood fiber to a growing material, it'll steal all the nitrogen because the bacteria that are associated with those sugars all want to process the nitrogen. And they'll, they'll get in a tug of war between the plant and the media, and the media will always win. Until right. that media is fully composted, the media will always win the tiger war over the plant. So that's why it's very, very important that they take out all those sugars so that when we add this material to growing medias, we don't end up with a, a nitrogen problem. Who wants to save money on a growing media if you're going to have to add three times the amount of nitrogen? Right. And then you're also chasing your tail, right? Because how much do I add? How much, you know? So it's better to have the sugars removed and then you have a more stable growing material. Yeah. This is a big pile of hydrofiber. So when, the, when we buy this material, it actually comes compressed six to one. So one bale of hydrofiber, like about the size of that lavatory over there, will create 20 yards of material. So it's very, very heavily compressed. Wow. So you have to have a special machine to take it apart. To, to fluff it out. Yeah. Definitely I would consider looking at that material because what it does is it, it, it turns the mix into uh, essentially kind of a more of a sponge. All our mixes are, are relatively nutrient void and they're essentially biological deserts. So you need to supply the nutrient and you need to supply the beneficial bacteria. All we're supplying really is a matrix or, or a, a framework for the roots to grow because essentially you're growing hydroponically. You're just using organic material to grow hydroponically in opposed to maybe glass wool which would be inorganic material to grow in. But the materials themselves are not providing a tremendous amount of nutrient or um, anything else. They're providing stability for the plant. So the mainstay for the nursery um, materials has always been fir bark or has been in the past fir bark. So this fir bark we actually pay particular attention to because there's two places you can get fir bark. One is from the coast and those logs come in on the Burrard Inlet, maybe up the Fraser River. But when you when you peel those logs and take the bark off, this the the salt content in in the bark can be very, very hot. And so if you're buying bark for your landscape and you buy it from some guy in Cloverdale or some other guy, he's gonna have taken peeled logs from the the Burrard Inlet and if you're going to put it around your road and and stuff, that's going to be fine. If you take material from the Burrard Inlet 
and you put it in a pot, you're going to have a salt index that's way too high, and you're going to get uh, you're going to get problems. So all of this bark actually comes from Lillooet. So we, we uh, either take bark from Lillooet and use uh, material that's never been in seawater, or we get bark from Squamish, uh, which, from a place that's called a dryland sort. So they don't use water to uh, convey the the logs across. They use uh, machinery. Okay. So that material comes from a dryland sort in Squamish. This material comes from uh, um, another dryland sort in uh, Little Egg. But uh, I've had great success at my farm with this product. So what this product is is a screened cedar material. So if you have a, a you know a, a regular diameter pot, you fill the pot uh, up till it's about two two and a half centimeters uh, away from the surface, and then you uh, add this material to the top of the pot. What this will do is it'll kind of pack in, and it'll form a bit of a matrix that dries relatively quickly and doesn't allow seeds to germinate. If you've got um, Say you've got fireweed in your pot and you broke off the fireweed but you still have a piece of that parsnip in the, in the bottom of the pot and then you put this on top, it's going to go right through. But if you're starting out with a clean media and then you put this on, you're looking at 90% reduction in weeds uh, for 24 months. And I'm not, I'm not being over, if you, if you do it properly, um, where people run into problems is sometimes, you know, that the, they've got the, the, the soil kind of pushed up around the edges of the container, so they have two and a half centimeters and right around the trunk, but yeah. then they only have this little little bit around the edges. Then you get start to get snapweed around the edges. That's not what I mean. It has to be, you know, a, a flat surface, and then you put two and a half centimeters of material on there. You're looking at a huge reduction in, in uh, weeding. Probably some of my very favorite ones. Um, this product is called Sea Fiber, and it's quite black because it has has gone through quite a bit of heating process and, and uh, uh, again to, re to remove all the oils because cedars have a lot of allopathic properties to their oils, but or which which kill plants. Um, but this material uh, is made up of cedar bark, and it is very very resistant to decay. So this material although not as maybe resilient as that chunky core I was showing you in the beginning, can last for three years in a pot and have uh, very little, little effect on its, on, on its growing. Um, so that's a, a, our finer fraction of sea fiber. And this is essentially the same, same material, except you'll get pieces of wood in it. The pieces of wood of course, the larger the pot, they aid in the drainage of the material. But this material, when mixed, our, our most popular nursery product is called our 50-50 mix, which is 50% sea fiber and 50% one of those fractions. So you can have a 50, mi 50 mix of 3 eighths, or you can have a 50-50 mix of, of 1 inch. But that, um, what people are, are finding is that the material is so stable, you can plant a tiny plant in a large pot rather than a tiny plant in a big... When they up potting and up potting, yeah. Up, up. yeah. So if you have space, uh, you can take a, a small pot and put it, or a plant and put it in a larger pot and then just wait. And you eliminate the labor of the transplant. We ran out of, almost ran out of peat uh, last year. So we have, of course, spatial, spatial problems. So we ended up stacking our peat five enough material so now we should have enough material for at least a year and a half <laughs> rather than just enough for a year or not even quite a year and then we had to buy during the same year so in theory if we had uh, a hope not we had another you know situation where peat was difficult to get we would be able to have a little bit more of a, a buffer that, um, that comes from Saskatchewan and we get peat from Alberta so Alberta and Saskatchewan that is an absolute mountain of peat the mountain of peat. That's actually the machine that we use to stack it because it has a telescopic arm on it. And it can, <laughs> can reach in. Yeah, we don't do it like the Egyptians with slaves.
That's it for my tour of Sumas Grow Media, and I just want to take this time at the end of the video to especially thank Bert Bischoff for his time in taking me around the site and all of his generosity in sharing his knowledge with us. Uh, it was a fantastic tour. There was a lot of topics that we that we covered and I had to chop it down just a little bit to fit within the confines of a YouTube video and there were some sections I couldn't use because of machine noise and everything else but uh, again super generous of him to share his knowledge with us. Uh, if you are a professional grower in our area I can highly recommend his professional soil mixing that company Sumas Grow Media they've always done really really well for me. All right thanks so much for watching and if you have any questions please drop those down into the comments below the video and I'll see what I can do to help.